Welcome to the Startup Microdose podcast with me, Ed Stevens, and my feline co-host, Oliver Jones. This conversation is with Emma Sale. Emma is the founder of notorious adult party brand Killing Kittens, which focuses on empowering female sexuality. Emma is widely hailed as the UK's foremost female sex entrepreneur. We learn how she built the Killing Kittens empire, which now holds events for its 100,000 plus members all over the world, as well as sex seminars and workshops on top of a thriving online dating community. We also discuss her latest product, Safe Date, an app plugin aimed at making dating safer. Emma delighted us with salacious tales and impressed us with her knowledge and unshakable conviction in the mission that has brought her so much success. So without further ado, we bring you Emma Sale. Um, greetings everyone, it's a great day to be alive, the weather is fine um, and football I'm told is uh, on its way home and uh, we are joined by Emma Sale, founder of Killing Kittens, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so we want to talk about Safe Date, which is your sort of latest project I think you've just launched. Yeah. But before we get into that to sort of contextualise you, it may be good to start with with Killing Kittens, which I think is probably fair to say that you're best known for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us about that. How did how did that get started? Um, so it's we're coming into the 13th year of it being in existence. And it was sort of, it came from like 13 years, 2005 it was launched and I was working in PR and I'd been working in the city um, before that and experienced some quite crappy sort of behavior from men in the city and it was kind of the time that sex in the city was out and and summers had hit the high street and lay low sex toys were going into selfridges and there was all, the, all this talk about sort of female sexual empowerment going on but yet the reality um, wasn't really happening and I had to leave two jobs because of harassment and the last one I was told that I'd be a troublemaker if I kicked up a fuss having complained to HR who happened to be best family friends with the director I was complaining about so it was sort of I was like right something needs to be done and the balance isn't right and with all this sort of talk about females um, you know being out there to explore their sexuality more there just wasn't they didn't see it was it seemed to be all talk um, and I was in entertainment PR and I started doing the um, PR for the erotica show and seeing loads of weird and wonderful people within the adult world but again it was all run by guys from the porn industry to the magazines to the shows you know all the different companies doing parties and stuff um, and just thought well you know right I'm gonna do something do something different and it was sort of a crazy um, wedding in Ibiza and I probably hadn't slept for about three days <laughs> and it was a very hedonistic crowd and the stuff I saw going on um, and one of the guests who couldn't make it phoned in and said is everyone just sat around killing kittens at the moment so we had this whole conversation about what did that mean and it was cyber slam for slang for every time you masturbate god kills a kitten you saw that it's like the um, most, most famous meme ever yeah exactly so i just you know in my i wasn't even hung over because i hadn't slept <laughs> um in my like it's like out of it state just thought killing kittens that's great and i love the two k's and it'll be kk um and right from minute one i just wanted to create a world where women were very much in control and empowered to explore their sexuality and not be judged and feel safe um, and completely in control and it'd be all about and all about them so what happened as small very underground parties um, slowly and gradually sort of has built into a big online community with events online and offline from you know half the events now which are curious kittens events um don't involve taking your clothes off they're sort of talks and workshops and <coughs> couples retreats um or just social meetups and then you have the full-on notorious killing kittens parties which are the masked sort of semi eyes wide shut mm -hmm. where if you want to get naked and shag you can get naked and shag mm -hmm. so um and and that's what it's become and then and the online side of it has sort of taken over in the last four years um we've got hundred thousand members online throughout the world and they use it as a kind of social network community online dating platform um and that's where it is at the moment 
With the first one, because I guess when you set these things up, um, there's a bit of anticipation of how, how you're going to kind of pull it together. Did you have um, a group of guests who are willing to kind of come on board and say, that's a great idea, we'll come to your first party? I mean, we'll what, did they, yeah, what, what did those first parties look like? I assume um, it wasn't friends and family. It definitely wasn't. Friends <laughs> and family. Um, it was, yeah, Uncle Bob. Um, <laughs> no, it was um, because I was kind of in the London entertainment world. Um, already and in and also socially in this sort of very promiscuous hedonistic crowd um, that were all at it left right and center um, it didn't it didn't really take long I sort of just had a load of you know an email like a database of people and just sent out this is what I wanted to launch and to be honest the first like six months we were talking 40 50 people mm. coming um, to the first parties so it's you know the nature of what it is even now we don't like going over 200 people maximum for any of the events because it takes the whole privacy and the safety and the intimacy out of it so actually most of our parties are actually under 150 people some are sort of 40 people still um, and that's you know that's how we want to keep it so we can do more and more events We'll just never do an event for 500 mm -hmm. um, I agree. People. I think you lose the oversight then. And then yeah. you, you get little pods of people breaking out into sort of maybe separate rooms. And I think that's maybe you're right where bad stuff happens when there's like slightly less communal ties. Um, yeah, exactly. And also, you know, the, at the end of the day, uh, the safety of uh, the women is paramount, paramount. And you can't, you know, it's very hard to, the more people you have, to kind of control that. And um, so what we say now is if you go to a party now, it's... Sort of, I want them to feel exactly how it felt 10 years ago mm. um, so that you know the numbers get controlled we use the same venues it's exactly the same format um, so, yeah. so in terms of, of safety and empowering female sexuality the USPs of, of the like the, the higher level more notorious parties am I right in saying that it's that the women have to approach the men yeah so we um, have we have rules and one of the main ones is that um, men can't approach girls they don't know they have to wait for the women to make the first move and we don't let single men in either and does, but does that mean in terms of um, like a sexual approach or just a conversational approach just a conversation right so that's the thing it's not a case of you can't even look at a woman it's a case of mm. you know you can't just go up and hit on them like you would a you would at a bar you, I mean you can go and stand next to them at a bar and sort of eye contact to say hi yeah but that's sort of it that you have to wait for them to start chatting um, I, I quite like the rules of conduct aspect of it because it does make it a bit clear-cut boundary it's like the woman is also empowered it's like if you do speak to that man then you are offering up a signal now because the rules are don't speak to him if you if you aren't sure that you want it to be a progressive situation yeah and it's about the you know the females feeling like they're the ones taking control um, and it's on their you know it's their call and and to be honest you know you go to any pubs or bars or clubs mm. anywhere in the world it's the complete opposite mm. you know you get hit on not so much now I'm eight and a half months pregnant but, um, <laughs> you know in my 20s um, you'd kind of walk anywhere you went you'd go to, from the bar to try and get to the bathroom or to the dance floor you know if you were wearing a short skirt there'd be hands up your skirt guys cracking onto you and you'd, you'd leave the club feeling completely seedy mm. and dirty and you know but, but is it never desirable that a man should be able to hit on a woman no I think I'm I'm quite old school to be honest yeah. so I think you know so for me it's nice it is nice that guys will open doors and be I don't think chivalry's dead and mm. I think yeah. men actually need to feel a bit in control it's like a masculine thing um, it's just we're just providing an environment where the women feel empowered and in control and it's not that's how it should be in the whole of society it's more about basically having respect and for the women to have self-respect and feel empowered and also the guys to realize the boundaries mm -hmm. and respect the females and respect that's what it's about so it's kind of that's what it is mm -hmm. it's not a case of going well women you know need to be the ones doing everything and making the first moves just in general because that's just not the case it's almost it? like a thought experiment isn't it you're giving it a contextual box because um i was in ibiza two weeks ago and exactly what you said happened. I felt really bad. These two girls sort of came onto the dance floor area and very quickly the, the sort of sea of men started drifting in and, and each 
group of them sort of came and made an advance mm. sorted away and some were so persistent that the girls did just leave the dance floor. I thought well yeah. that's so crap you spent 50 euros each for a night out wanted to have a dance just wanted to have a dance and you're getting mobbed and, and I I'm not going to sort of cast too many things but the European men seem quite forward I think maybe English men are a bit more repressive. I don't think that's true of all of them. Some yeah. of them are <laughs> intensely aggressive, but they just, they were very hands on without even speaking yeah. to them. And it was, it, it made me feel uncomfortable. And then as a guy, you go in there and I, I remember telling a few of them, just like, look, look, just, just back off. And then they start getting quite aggressive with you. So it sort of escalates everything. And you're like, well, I don't know how you yeah. meant to marshal this. There's it's that piece of meat thing. And actually as a girl, when you're treated like that, then how are you meant to feel empowered or self-respect if you've got, guys literally treating you like you're a, you're a piece of meat and that you've got one purpose in life. So yeah. Do, do you find that you get lots of, um, I guess, feedback or testimonials from, from people who, who go to these parties, um, women in particular, saying that they feel more confident um, and it's actually helped them in relationships? Because it seems yeah. kind of counterintuitive to say that, oh, I went to a, a sex party and now my my monogamous relationship is much better yeah it's funny because people assume from the outside or you know they'll read the daily mail specials um that it's just a big shag fest and you know guys getting the rocks off um <laughs> but actually we get you know we get a lot of girls and we've got on our blog um we do a lot of reviews every week there's different reviews and stories from girls and the reasons why they come to the parties and and, and it's been fascinating reading them because a lot have come from very religious backgrounds where they've been oppressed um, been in relationships quite abusive you know with a guy very much sort of you're my property um, and then we've got girls that have come you know have been sexually abused and they're just you know and, and not from the outside you could go that's probably the worst place if someone's been raped they could possibly go but actually if you really think about it it's you know they've lost their sense of being empowered by being sexually mm. abused and it's getting that power back mm -hmm. and it's not the parties aren't necessarily a, right you turn up you get naked and have sex actually 50 percent of the people that come don't engage in full sex mm -hmm. they just come a lot of the girls come in groups and they just dance around in their lingerie yeah. go to the bar chat and they just feel liberated and empowered because they're not being hit on yeah and they're kind of owning it um and so there's loads of different reasons why why people come and we're always getting feedback. Well, I think um, quite interesting. So that was part of the research I did for this um, when I was speaking to Ollie just before the show. Um, I thought was really important and really important to uh, identify was the work you are doing for people who have um, either issues with shame or um, having been sexually abused. And I do think it potentially offers like a first cornerstone into them feeling again that they can explore this again with you, you otherwise your option i guess is to just annex sexual conduct from your from your world and say look i'm not in control yeah. of it. i don't want anything to do with it whereas i do think um there could be a really good therapeutic quality and i thought that mission statement was was really nice um and probably completely different from some of the narrative that comes out about it just being frivolous fun potentially destructive chaos that people yeah. go into and i don't think people are that naive I think I think it's adults, as you say, just sort of questioning the status quo in an environment that you're creating that's safe for them to do so. Um, how has your ambitions for that changed over time? Because you mentioned bringing in the the non-sexual workshop type aspects of that. Do you do work within those workshops to um, help on the the sort of sexual abuse side? The yeah, we've got um, to be honest, right from day one. And you know, I remember when I got the logo done, I wanted the two Ks, and I said I didn't want the word in killing kittens i just wanted two k's i said because it's the, it's going to start I joked about it being like the m in mcdonald's um, that it's going to stand for something and so in my head it was always start off the small parties and then it become a much bigger entity but always with helping women mm. at the at the front of it um and yeah that you know the parties are fun and um you know that's enough for a lot of people but there's also you know the serious when it comes to women our biggest sexual organ is our brain so you know you can have the parties where there's loads of shagging going on but if your brain's not in the right state or mm. something's happened to you um or you need more confidence or you come out of a crappy relationship um or you just want to learn then you're not going to really get that at a party so it was kind of we launched um, curious kittens i think about three years ago to provide that 
the non full on part but actually to if you want to learn if you want to men and women so we have men only talks and men only workshops um, with dating experts on you know the art of approaching and being approached and how to treat women and you know that kind of thing all the way through to massage your man which is you know the tantric massage a complete range um, we've got an in-house um, sex expert and psychologist who sort of analyzes a lot of the reviews who come in and is also available sort of one-on-one -on -one via Skype to talk to couples or talk to people that need extra help um, so yeah to me it's sort of being you know being responsible <laughs> you've got to provide that side to it because it's yin and yang you, you get some people feeling completely empowered but then for other people it might not be the right environment mm -hmm. to come into um, so it's providing the whole spectrum um, and dealing with the brain as well as the physical to get that overall sort of confidence back in women mm. um, sorry go on I was just going to say there's something about discussion around these topics as well that I think disarms them you know for women you, you probably because there's all this thing of, of you know slut shaming of oh, I can't believe you slept with all these men yeah. you need to speak to each other to kind of get a barometer for actually what other people think and, and, and an honest discussion around it so people can say oh I don't need to feel shame or embarrassment or, or like some kind of hang up about it it's like I think we'd all do better to sort of just stop pretending we're all whiter than white and super simple and, mm. and when we unearth these topics and can discuss them I think uh, only stands to benefit yeah most people and understanding without, without judgment and I think that that was part of my sort of anger when I first launched it was a kind of a guy that slept with 20 girls was a legend hmm. whereas a single girl who slept with 20 guys was a slut and a lot of guys even guy friends of mine would come out with comments yeah but she sort of slept around and I'd be like and yeah, yeah. what's your point yeah, it's just damaged goods that can't be girlfriend material it's sort of yeah it was very kind of double standards it's got a lot better over the last decade it's still not it's still not great but I mean personally I'd rather you know my hubby was a complete ass um, before me <laughs> but um, complete player but I'd rather you know end up with someone that has slept around and you know got it out of his system yes. than a guy that turns up who slept with one woman mm. that to me would be slightly more daunting, worrying actually. Yeah. and daunting and thinking mm, you know he hasn't been out there and learned about himself and learned what's right and wrong and all that kind of side of things so personally I just I think it's good for you know if you're single to go out and explore and experiment and yeah and not uh, be judged yeah and providing the platform for that helps and conversations I guess we flatter ourselves but like this the more these conversations are had the more people can feel comfortable um discussing and and, and doing these sorts of things um on, on the business side um your background, as you said, was in, is in PR. Has it been, because I don't think you, from what I read, you got investment at the start. It was just a sort of organic growth through, through yeah. I guess, PR it's, channels. It's all, been, it's all been organic and actually it's only been the last couple of years with the whole growth of our digital online side and realizing that, you know, that actually amounted to sort of 40, 50% of our revenue. Mm -hmm. But yet the whole team was offline and it was growing organically. That you That made me think actually, this needs to be sorted and if people got hold of it who really know their, de their tech and digital world then you know it could it's got a hell of a lot of potential but I'm not an online person mm -hmm. so um, but tech and digital costs a lot of money yeah um, mm. so it kind of has got to the point where actually if we want to go yeah, it's basically go big or go home so um, so that's why we're doing our first raise at the moment you're doing equity crowdfunding is within it? the crowdfunding on just Cedars, crowdfunding yeah. on Cedars yeah well, presumably you've got a huge database to go to yeah well we kind of it's sort of we were gonna we're a bit late down the road this year on doing it we were going to do it earlier on in the year and the you know the original thought was to do it on the old school investment level mm. um and get you know people more on the big investors putting 100 or 200 and then it kind it just wasn't sitting right with me it just wasn't i didn't feel comfortable going well and i just said you know, I don't really want sort of four or five big city guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ironically, putting, it's putting the money in who, you know, they're not really going to be very useful to me other than the money. Mm -hmm. um, and it just doesn't fit with what it's about. And more and more people in the back of my head, I thought we've got this massive community and I don't really know 
who a lot of the members are or what they do and more and more people were saying I don't think you realize you know the power of actually your community so we put an email out just saying this is what we're hoping to do and if you want to be part of our journey um, let us know um, click this link time thing because how, um, how many members have you got worldwide 100, now 100,000 100, five, that's five pounds a user isn't it yes. which they're already spending on parties and yeah. Yeah. yeah but we had over a thousand replies wanting in you know expressing interest and a lot of them over 100 were like high net worth individuals who are the ones you can speak to directly yeah um and that made us go well actually you know it is about community mm. i'd rather have 200 people feeling like they own part of it um then have five city boys well quite yeah. it'd be a bit like coca-cola owning innocent that if your whole mission statement was owned by the city types that you said kind yeah. of abused you out of a job then it <laughs> it kind of comes full circle to actually corrupting your own mission yeah exactly and also you know all the girls you know all our female members and they can't put a hundred thousand in but they can put a tenner in mm -hmm. so it's sort of i wanted everyone to have access and feel part of it um so that's why yeah we went down the um the crowdfunding route because i think and that's sorry that's active now yeah it's active now and we're nearly we're raising 500,000 and we're on about 430,000 mm. raised. So Amazing. Get involved, people. <laughs> so, yeah, it kind of, yeah, we're going to start there till the end of July, probably. Cool. Um, and that, yeah. that will springboard the, the digital side, which uh, I guess because now you do have a challenge of bringing together uh, a more global community and how do you curate yeah. events for them or do you make it sort of hi like local for local? Do you know, your members in Australia have those meetups or do you have big global events or do you have all sorts of... Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, what we're going to do is we want to do Sydney and New York, um, how we've done London. Yep. Um, because the parties we're having there are, are getting over 100 people. So the community, we've got the communities there, we've got the members there we just want to start doing all the talks and the workshops and so part of the raise is to put teams on the ground in those cities um and then a lot of most of it is for the sort of the growth activation side of the whole tech digital it's not to build it mm -hmm. that's all being built that's nearly finished mm -hmm. so it's all if we don't get money in it's still happening because the whole platform's built it's going being tested in the next two weeks um with a thousand members and the app's all done so it's more of activating it all and activating the other cities so we can as i said earlier go big or go home yeah basically. do you see um a typical user demographic or, or if you go through your users is there a sort of a typical user or are you seeing that change because i guess my point with that is when, when we look at sort of 20 year olds nowadays it seems like they're all growing up with even more liberal questions in mind of, of gender and all these other things so i wonder is there a cutoff point or, or are you seeing new members come in in their early 20s or is we're seeing a lot more we've seen this year actually a lot more single girls who are in their early 20s right joining up and a lot more single girls attending the full-on the killing kittens event and these girls are you know they don't say they're straight they don't say they're lesbian mm. they're you know they very much sort of one day they want to sleep with a guy the next day they fancy a woman and it's sort of and the confidence in them the difference i see in them compared to when my lot were all in our early 20s and really insecure and like Ooh. Hmm. um it's amazing they you know they own it <laughs> and you know then there's no means no and this is how we want to be treated and no not interested you know whereas our lot were more oh why doesn't he like me we want to make him like me yeah <laughs> um, so i wonder if it shifted the other way and it's now the 20 year old men it's who who is totally like lost <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so yeah there's a big shift in that but also what we find is sort of the average age for the killing kittens parties is probably late mid late 30s right. um whereas the average age for the, the curious kittens events and the socials and the meetups um that we do with the curious side is more 20s mm -hmm. more the late 20s so there is that kind of and what we're doing with the new platform is which is it's it's going to be called kittens world um is having it for everyone mm -hmm. um and within that there's the killing kittens party bit the vetting the registration bit sort of security side but the actual full-on site is everyone and anyone can join up and it'll have all the content all the blog features in there and just be a big online community with all these sort of social meetups happening S offline as well so part of it is exclusive the but which part of it so at the moment with the the killing kittens side and the killing kittens parties there's quite a strict sort of registration vetting process online 
Um, but like looking at what? It's that's got a lot to do with age, right? Um, and also we don't like single men in, right? For um, them, all the guys have to be accompanied by a girl. It's very sort of because of the nature of those parties, mm -hmm. the security has to be a lot higher. Mm. Um, but is there like a looks profile? Not we don't not really. We, we you know a lot of people have been you know we've been accused of being fattest and it's all about the looks and we look that we do ask for photos um but we're looking for sort of just nice looking people mm -hmm. so people that take care of themselves um rather than you know if someone puts up a photo in a complete gimp mask you sure. know tied up mm, full sure. bondage gear and with a whip in hand you know um it's just not there's just a certain yeah because i yeah. guess that could be misinterpreted as uh like going against your mission statement to empower women if you're only letting certain people in yeah no um, we're not to be honest it's more a lot of with a lot of the events have different ages so there's some that's open yeah. to everyone there are other ones where you know the cutoff point is age is 45 mm -hmm. um and that's but that's just what the members want yeah so we'll kind of provide all sorts of sometimes we'll have older ones where you have to be over 45 to attend them and some are girls only right um so yeah i mean we do we provide across the spectrum on cool. that front but the curious kittens events and the meetups and the socials we do with them are open to everyone and anyone because i think there does have to be an art of curation you know any good party um unfortunately there has to be a sort of subjective decision making lens on it otherwise you, you know the commercial model starts to break down which is that people don't enjoy themselves they don't come back and then the whole thing ceases to exist mm. anyway um do you have in party security so will there be one or two you know guys just yeah. assign, and is it guys who are assigned to so yeah we have between two and four pretty much between two and four um badge securities at right. the events and they are at the moment they're all they are guys and, but actually we we've thought for years do we get a female security but actually we've surveyed all the members and especially the single girls that come and actually they, they feel safer yeah. having a badged male security because if there is any issues it genuinely will involve a guy yep. who's got two pest and a little bit handsy mm -hmm. <laughs> um and that needs a male security to deal with and also i think for as from a guy being there if they see male security then they're going to be a bit better behaved if they see female security they'll be like whatever it's true <laughs> so, well, it's, yeah. a, it's a big question about the the empowerment because um i was watching some stuff about this sort of first well I say first wave feminism it wasn't really it was second wave feminism in the 70s and it was the vote on college campuses to say we don't want curfews we want to go out late but we still know and identify and recognize that men are dangerous yeah. we just wish to endanger ourselves we wish to be out because it's our choice and i think that's that's still the problem today is no matter how many rules and restrictions we put in it's like it, it, even if ollie and i came up against a guy who was six foot eight it's like we're we are now in danger it's up to that guy to choose to to behave yeah. but if something kicks off if he drinks too much and decides he wants a problem yeah. with us we're in danger and we have to be able to administer that so i do understand with your your parties it's like if it needs a six foot five guy to just have some oversight and make everybody feel safer yeah. then you don't even get the trigger points of the bad behavior because the guy who's being handsy won't even hopefully go down that yeah. that path. Um, it's, it's as, as part of the way you grew, um, did you court um, sort of uh, the notoriety of it? Did you like play up to the idea of it being a hedonistic shag fest, even though that's not actually what your mission statement is? But because I think understandably it could be misinterpreted yeah. that way and you could be accused as such did you like was it good pr but even though it you was know what? coming from a pr background it kind of i knew that there was something in it from being in pr where you where you write press releases you're trying to get hold of journalists all the time there's some big scary editors you know all their names no one ever wants to speak to you um coming from that background and within a month of launching killing kittens having incoming calls from the editors made me go there's something mm. something's going on here mm -hmm. um and it was never a case of courting it was you know it's like you don't court the tabloids <laughs> it, they just happen yeah um and you have no control over what they write you have no control what their headlines are you can you know it took me a couple of years to kind of grow a really thick skin mm -hmm. not read the comments yeah <laughs> um and just read you know read articles and be sort of the bits about me were completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I skimmed over them. It was more, how does a business come across? 
is the message right is it going to get us more members yeah um and that's what it you know it's tomorrow's fish and chip paper that's what it kind of has always been mm -hmm. in my head the you know the ones that are courted would be the more broadsheets where you're talking more of a business angle um but again up until literally this year we've never written a press release or phoned out to try and be courted or get media attention it's all been incoming yeah um incoming calls and emails and asking us to contribute and um comment on certain things happening um so it's been fascinating on that level um it's only this year with the business and the raise and all the tech stuff that for the first time ever we've got you know we've got a pr in now four months ago mm -hmm. um to do all that side of it yeah um and that's yeah but i guess so you wrote a book um behind the mask um was that i don't know when that came out 2014 24 so relatively recently so was that not kind of playing up i mean i haven't read it but was it not playing up you can read it about an hour <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um was it not playing up to the to the, the hedonistic side what it was yeah do you know what with it in it is more it's more of a story in that as in my story because we had the whole time we've been doing kk the amount of people because you come out with stories and you're at dinner parties and you're at drinks and you're chatting about what goes on and the amount of people are like you need to write a book this need is mm. you know, this isn't normal yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know get it down and it's sort of the more and more we're doing it and you know more and more people said that it was sort of well actually now's the time so it was quite it's sort of i think the metro said it was sort of jackie collins meets sex in the city um but it was kind of it's sort of my story and group of girlfriends sort of trying to find love whilst all this crazy killing kittens parties were going on in the background um, and does sort of sexual empowerment female sexual empowerment like fit into that yeah it does but i mean the way because of the whole security side of it a lot all the names have been changed it's, sure. it's, it's fact yeah it all happened but rather than there's sort of five i think main girls in it but they've all got different names and they're all based on four or five girls i know mm -hmm. so all the stories are real but they didn't necessarily happen to one person mm -hmm. um so it's more you've got all that going on and then organizing the parties in the background imagine at the book launch when all we your friends turned up and they were just able to point each other out yeah <laughs> a few wow. people and a few of the guys yeah knowing exactly who yeah who was who. But i think it's good i think people often want to drift i mean as 50 shades of gray showed they want to live in fantasy and it's like well if you are creating the reality and can port back actual stories from you know as you say it is a weird and wonderful world um then i think it it's quite exciting that it is based in reality or, or give or take yeah. blended reality but um y you know you're, you're able to trailblaze and, and it is a hell of a story um i think especially in in england um i guess in france and stuff like yeah, this they, they love whatever. a bit of a yeah they're very sort of laissez-faire uh, with their attitudes um has there been a, a kind of journey for you from when you set it out to to how your views on on sex and relationships have have changed iterated do you see them as separate are they separate until they're no longer separate like how have any of your perceptions changed i don't think my perception has changed i've always been i've always been the sort of person that just wants everyone not everyone to be happy but everyone basically as long as no one's getting hurt mm. then i'll never who am i you to judge anyone and i've kind of i've always been like that and i grew up in the middle east and was at school over here mm. and i just sort of since i was little been immersed in so many different cultures and behaviors and people so i've got used to seeing you know loads of different people from all walks of life behaving in completely different ways that i'm just not judgmental mm. in that way at all and it's the same with um you know sexuality i mean i've never you know i've never been someone that slept around or had one night stands but that's just me i've never judged friends that have that's just how i personally get too emotionally involved very quickly <laughs> so it was sort of very early on was well that's just not a good route for me personally to go down um whereas lots of girlfriends are like whatever and we'll sleep with seven different guys in a week and not give them a second thought God. um so not that many of them um, <laughs> but it's sort of so my perceptions haven't changed if anything you know i, I was open-minded anyway i've become a lot more i've learned a lot more about sexuality and the way people tick and 
the different levels of it and also the different you know reasons why couples will come to the parties and get involved mm. um so I probably before I did it you know you had that whole there's that whole swinging thing mm. you know which people have of sort of the middle-aged couples throwing keys into the into bowl swapping partners and then their relationships must be broken kind of you've always kind of in my mid to early 20s when just before i launched this there was probably part of me that that was the only perception i had um of couples being involved in this world and so that side's definitely my eyes have probably been open and actually i say now this most secure couples i know who i become very good friends with are some of our members who mm. have the most amazing relationships and it's just what they do um and they trust each other completely they're exploring their sexuality together the woman might be bi-curious or bisexual and the husband just lets her get on with that but without feeling insecure or like he's going to lose her so i think that's the that's the problem a lot of people especially it's more of a male thing is that control and wanting to control the women because of their insecurities and they think the woman's going to leave them so they kind of pull them in even tighter when actually the irony is that is how you're going to lose them mm -hmm. whereas if you just let them be themselves even going out for drinks the amount of guys i know who oh it's insane it's insane who i have girlfriends i'm like why are you on your phone still well he's just you know he just won't stop texting these are husbands so boring it's for just everyone. so yeah, boring yeah and just what a waste of your your mental faculties to yeah. be checking up on somebody if somebody's going to play away from home i guarantee you t like nine times out of ten they'll probably get away with it yeah and and you'll find that when That's you find out if they're going to do it they're going to do it mm. yeah and, and and the more you put up resistance the more creative yeah. they'll be in their their problem solving he said, yeah and, and i have a big issue actually within relationships is there's sort of this obligation to um you know, you, you can't chat everything over and chat everything to death and sort of investigate the navel gazing of every thought you have about everybody who walks past mm. you on the street. But at the same time, the obligation to sort of just, I guess, be dishonest to preserve the peace. You know, a lot of people have to sort of go, oh, no, I've never thought an unpure thought about anything ever. And it's like, well, it's bollocks. It's just bollocks. <laughs> and you're just, you're going to have to lie to people yeah. just to kind of keep this white. Exactly. Than white. I, I probably check out women walking past me quicker than we have I have a competition sometimes with my husband hmm. you know I probably yeah. check out the girls walking mm -hmm. past me quicker than he does mm -hmm. because it's a natural female thing yeah that's mm -hmm. how we operate on aesthetics and oh you know I, I want her bum <laughs> and you know that's a great dress she looks you know it's what we do it's a natural thing in the same way you know we're all animals guys are going to check out girls it doesn't mean they're gonna you know leave you and want to jump in their pants it's just it's natural and you can't deny it and you can't you know you shouldn't pretend you're not doing it yeah well there is a, a primitive narrative around men i think i think some girls still treat men and and, and i do think some men operate this and, and i frown on them like there's definitely i think layers within men of yeah i see a man who's lechy and and too persistent as weak it's like you, you've got you've got this weird compulsion mm. that you cannot control and any compulsion essentially is in control of you you're not in control of it and so i see men who who um are overly aggressive or, or have these alpha male types who think it's like you know play the game or neg women or whatever and i think they're pathetic and I, I look down on them but i think some women also look at men like all we can think about is sleeping with people mm. and sometimes you go not in a million years like i wouldn't or i'm not even thinking of that it's, it's not just a common a constant goal to get in to people's pants yeah and i think I've got, I, I, as a guy i can find that quite frustrating that you're sort of being second guessed as though that's your constant objective and it's like I really am not even yeah. geared that way so i don't know how those levels balance out because obviously women are alert to the 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 worst kind of guy because they're the one that keeps swooping in and trying to sort of create that mm. for themselves because they see it as like a, some kind of goal seeking exercise um and it can be quite frustrating as a guy who's not geared that way to sort of be like I i'm here just to, to to chat to you hang out have fun be friends I, I don't really i'm not trying to sort of angle it that way all the time going back to what you were saying um this like idea of people being on different levels on i think it's called kinsey scale yeah it is it's from one to seven one to seven yeah. um with one being full one heterosexual being straight totally straight and seven being totally gay yeah yeah so do you think this idea of say if um say there's a, a married couple the man is one and the woman is three yeah right so she has sort of some wavering interest towards towards women as well do you think given the like that we're in a slightly more liberated society than maybe it's ever been before um 
in that married relationship, the husband will feel insecure about that and try and control her and stop her from having an outlet. Um, could that be contributing to or one of the factors involved in the increased divorce rate? And do you think, therefore, that if things like killing kittens can allow couples like that to have a, you know, a safe way of um, scratching the itch? Yeah, <laughs> then then that's a good thing. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And um, um, but uh, but actually, scientifically, when most women fall three, four, five on that scale, and that's just fat. Right. Um, but it's been a very much, you know, we've been in this very monogamous sort of setup of you find a guy, you get married, and that's it, you're straight. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same for guys, you know, there's been a lot of <clears throat> older men coming out because they couldn't, you know, they weren't allowed to be gay or they didn't want to, you know, be seen to be being gay. Yeah. Um, so there's still a lot of a lot of that, whereas now it's sort of society is a lot more open on that. And women are a lot, uh, you know, they are a lot more vocal. So it's not that kind of just sort of women know your place and just lie back and think of England and and you need the guy for the financial security and mm. which a lot of, you know, sort of my parents' generation, I'm very much that, I've just turned 40, that kind of generation of being really in the middle um, where a lot of our parents are the real old school setup of the women at home the guy's working yeah um and i you know i know a lot of people's parents who split in their sort of 60s 50s i mean minor one um and a lot of the time that you know the women didn't feel like they could ever leave the husband because they had no money they had no job they were pretty much tied um and they had nowhere to go um whereas nowadays you know we're a lot more independent we're a lot more financially independent we can leave yeah you know we don't have to put up with what women used to put up with mm -hmm. and we have a voice and we have a say in our sexuality and our sex lives we don't just have to lie back and think of England mm -hmm. um, and so that's making a lot more women more vocal especially the ones that are in the middle or a bit by curious so they're starting to have you know be more vocal with their husbands say this is what I'm thinking this is how I'm feeling and and it comes down to communication and you know, all relationships come down to communication, even if you're both one on that scale. Mm -hmm. If you're not honest with each other and communicate, then that's when the PAs and the gardeners <laughs> affairs yeah. come, in, <laughs> the come into the coach. picture, the tennis coach, <laughs> exactly. Um, or oh, in my dad's case, the Polish masseuse <laughs> comes into the, you know, comes into the picture. So it's, you know, what I find with a lot of our members is that open and that they've had proper conversations. Yeah. Um, and the guys have often realized that you know, if they don't, you know, ha communicate like this and allow the woman to scratch the itch <laughs> yeah. to go out there, then they, you know, they probably will end up losing yeah. them. I, sorry. So I was going to say, could that raise a question of parity? Because I, in a sort of, um, let's take it back to a grayscale sense, the guy um, abides, you know, he's, he's comfortable with the idea his woman would like to explore um, her sexuality it may flip between you know wanting to go with women hope i, I imagine it'd be more difficult for him to say i understand yeah, with, I other men. with other men then you've got a problem yeah. but then if let's say he's a one and he goes well the issue is here i can't feasibly go and sleep with other women to explore what yeah. i need to explore yet you're spending let's say two evenings or three evenings a month now sleeping with women if he turns it into a point scoring exercise yeah. how, how does he possibly get an outlet what, what should what would you recommend a guy well, I, does you know i had this conversation with her it was a couple about a month ago and she was saying that no not married but they've been together a couple of years and she you know she was saying she likes girls hmm. she wants to be with a guy but likes girls and you know i had this conversation um it was quite a heated debate in the pub um that she you know wants to sleep with with girls a yeah. few years, not all the time but just that's sort of something she likes and he said well if you do that i should be able to just go out and sleep with girls and she it's went not it's not the same yeah. that's you know competing with me and that's as in her um and it's the same thing her sleeping with her girls is completely different yeah and it's not it's not actually in competition it's not um the same thing it is it's a different it's a different want it's a different need it's different turn-ons it's it's a different physical action um the guy but the guy was like well i'm not interested in sleeping with guys so i should be able to 
if you sit with two girls, I should be able to sit with two other well, girls. Well, I think and he's it's like, well, wrong, it's, but yeah. at the same time, it's like, what is the outlet? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. there is that simple time outlet that yeah. you have intimacy with um, with a girl. They'll be, you know, chatting in bed, laughing, whatever mm-hmm. else, all the other things that come with it. And then it's like, well, if he's an absolute zero in terms of other engagement, mm. if, it's, it's quite hard to know yeah. how that well, would balance. Said, well, could I, you know, would I, would I, would I want to watch? And she said, no way. And that's when I stepped in and said, you've got to kind of, you've got to bend a bit yeah yeah you mm. can't and actually that's what a lot of you know a lot of the couples who do that do mm. is that the guys will be around or the girl lets them join in the guys join in but not have full penetration so mm. it's sort of the guy can well you know it'll be more of a threesome um in order to get that girl on girl action and the guy can sort of mess around a bit mm. but mm. they have kind of all, you know they all have different rules and different boundaries and i think that's a, that's the main thing again it's the communication that they've decided what they can and can't do in this setup so the guy isn't suddenly going to start shagging a girl if their rule is he can't do that mm. um and in the same way the girl can play with other girls but she can't just suddenly start having sex with a guy so that's where you get in trouble you've got to have very clear rules and boundaries of what you can and can't do yeah it comes down to to communication and and sort of maturity of communication there was a good podcast um with sam harris and this guy called jeff miller who's a psychologist i think but he's a um a poly polyamorous um which isn't a polygamist and he was saying so he's he described it as pair bonded to one woman and they're like that's his like closest relationship Mm. and he'd do anything for her etc but they both have other relationships outside yeah. of that and because they're he described it as being like very intelligent and um, emotionally engaged because obviously you're going to experience jealousy if the person you love most is g- going to experience something that you imagine is just something for you and them to experience together but actually if you want what's best for them in the world mm. if they want to explore that you should give them that outlet and so as long as you can be self-aware about those emotions and be intelligent enough to rise above them um then he argues you can um make a very very um stable relationship yeah. despite the fact and probably i'm a couple they're, they're on the up as in more and more yeah. more and more people are doing that because also you realize more and more people realize that you know you, there's been too much of this you need one person and that person can give you everything yeah and actually they can't and even it's a lot to ask one person yeah and i say this to girlfriends who whinge about not being able to have full-on conversations you know with their husbands and stuff i'm like well yeah that's what you've got girlfriends for yeah. you know actually yeah, mm. you've got different people for different things you shouldn't it's when you put everything into that one person and expect that person to be this perfect human being mm-hmm. who is the one you talk to about everything that you travel with mm-hmm. you do all your sport with you do you know they, it's the be all and end all i think that's when it gets dangerous yeah and, and, and i think then that's when the attempt to control the outcomes of your partner increase because as you say you're demanding 365 days a year because that's the, the problem with um monogamous relationships essentially you, you can have a prediction for how it will be the next five years but you're being tested any day of the week over the next 20 30 years of your life your marriage could be going through a bad two years as a result of anything mm. somebody's away all the time and you're just tested 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 and it's like it's really difficult and then i think some people just go oh, i only live once so you know whatever uh, and it, it's it's really complicated i think because we we're doing two things i think one technology is now not letting anybody really have a thought to themselves and everything has this weird audit trail whereas uh, you know back in the 1800s or, or 1900s somebody going off traveling the world would disappear for three months mm. and i imagine you wrote letters to each other or whatever but they could probably then explore things with some kind of degree of anonymity and two we're, we're eroding community structure as well so you're not getting that I'll just, you know, speak to my neighbours or speak to the people in the village yeah. about other things. It's that responsibility and that's, you know, that's a community is a massive part of our setup. And I think society now, they don't, you're not answerable to anyone. Mm. It's very, um, you know, transient. It, there's no community. So actually people behave like assholes yep. because they're not, they're not part of a community. And also at the same time, you get people who are really lonely. Um, and we get a lot of girls and guys who, you know, who move to London and they like the curious kitten side of it because of the social side because they're like 
we've been in London a year and haven't really made good friends and we didn't we came in not knowing anyone and it's a really they want that community um, who will have your back who will you know who will be there if whatever happens but at the same time who will not let you get away with stuff mm. who will tell you if your behavior is out of order who and you need that that's how you know that's just how society's always worked it's mm. how tribes worked it's how you know third world works it's you know it's very tribal it's very community based it's you take responsibility and the problem with the western world and a lot of it is the digital side yeah. is people can behave like assholes yeah and they can catfish and they can pretend to be things they're not online and I, you know it's very sad and you hear about you know you hear stories all the time you know we did a big star survey on the whole dating side of things and it was something like nearly 60 percent of people admit who are online dating admitted lying about stuff on their profile it wasn't like 10 percent it was 60 percent it's you know it's a lot more it's, it's a lot that's actually probably a good a good point to to talk about your new project because I think the dating world is changing and, and now it seems to be comfortable with the idea that technology is mediating um, these interactions and as you rightfully point out I think the profile is is the fishing line out to try and catch the fish and people will put everything they can forward best photos best is that which always sets an expectation up here and then it seems when people go on these dates the reality always falls short of what they've used to try and catch people in the first place which makes sense because yeah. you put your best foot forward up to catch you know you're the best potential partner yeah and then i also think the issue with you know a dating app is you're sat opposite somebody having to make a decision about the next 40 years of your life within one one meeting whereas you know are you well no but you you have to then you have <laughs> to say is it working on a another, second date yeah. is it working on a third date whereas right. if you meet somebody organically let's say i guess people meet through work people meet through any through friends you hang out with them more and more and mm. then you grow to sort of like the idea that you may like them more than you thought you. You. yeah yeah which is a really nice way of looking at it, rather than going this has to justify a next mm. step um so you're coming in to tackle the issue around dating uh, with your your new app your new project could you explain that to us and, and um so it's an app called safe date that we launched last week and it's sort of it came about as a bit of a byproduct in that we have these community groups these forums um chat groups which have sort of over 50 people in each one and we have a couple of them that are girls only um and we were finding that a lot of the girls in those groups were going on these tinder dates and hookups um and they didn't really want to they're a bit embarrassed to tell their friends they're going for a quick shag so they basically say on these groups um that they're going off to meet this guy and here are his details and if they don't check back in to the group by like midnight or whatever to send out a search party so we were seeing that happen loads and we've all you know everyone's done that um when they've been on dates and stuff um and so we were seeing more and more of that happening and thinking well with our new platform we're building that we need that technology in there so that people can register that they're going on dates and all the details and decide who their safe contact people are so in the event they don't check back in to the site um, then their safe people will get a message with all the details on so they can come find you um so we were going we were doing that and then after the discussions um in the office it was more actually it's the kind of thing you want teenage girls to be able to mm. use and it doesn't have to be dates it could be play dates it could be going to the cinema age 12 going to the cinema with five friends and you have your parents on as your safe people and they just know that you know you're being sort of tracked and you know where you're going and re and register and then you log back in um and if that was the case then we couldn't no parents gonna allow the kk app <laughs> to be downloaded <laughs> onto their onto their child's phone so we decided to do it as a completely standalone app that's global and open to everyone and anyone so hence the safe date um and and that and it's a very simple format you go on you re, you know you register you can register via your facebook profile you put in all your details which app you know which dating app you've used or doesn't have to be an app or where you so met it works person. in conjunction with the existing technology it's not yeah. to facilitate that uh, yeah date, it's is not it? it's not a dating app um it's very much and we're already you know we talks with some dating setups who want to put the safe date into their system so that on their profiles people's profiles on their dating sites it'll have the little safe date icon which means people will know that you know the person they're going on a date with it has safe date installed on their phone so 
someone's watching <laughs> and tracking them, which might, you know, put off predators. <laughs> yeah, even though. Oh, right, so, so the person, well, I, I guess in, in most cases, it's the the female with the safe date. Well, they're not exclusively, right? It could no, be. No, it could be male. Yeah. That's the thing. It can, it could be, it can be guys. It can be, you know, it can be, te- you know, teenage boys. It yeah. can be, you know, gay couples, guy gay couples. It, you know, it's, it's everyone and anyone. Mm. But the person who goes on the date with them, knows that they're on safe date they, they can do they don't have to they don't it's only if it's only if they've met on a on a dating site where we've linked up with right them, so they'll see it but at the moment it's you can go on a date you're you'll put in all the person's details mm. you'll then decide who your safe people are right one person you give three people mm. you don't even have to tell them that they're your safe person so that's that's part of it is that privacy and security so you can put so you put in the safe person you put in the time that you want to check back in to the app and mm. if you don't check back in at that time then those safe people will get a message yeah. saying your friend so and so has been on a date she hasn't checked back in click here for the date details yeah so that's how it works at the moment so in the event of everything going smoothly you check back into the app then your safe people don't even need to Got are it. completely unaware that you've been on a date would that yeah. willingly um lend a location for where they are now so if if holly went on a date and i don't hear from him at 11 11, 11 p.m it tells me i've not heard from Ollie. you would be my state person <laughs> <laughs> would it say he was meant to be in high street kensington but actually his location has been identified we're adding as- that at the moment so the initial the initial launch um has the details of where they've where they've been um but we're adding in the next couple of weeks the you can drop a pin and also it's you just get tracked so mm. in the event, event something really goes wrong and say the police get involved we'll be able to go here's her route yeah this is where she's been okay. at what time and this is who she went on a date with so yeah i mean um, obviously this doesn't actually preclude any uh sexual violence or whatever it happens to be happening on the date yeah um but i think it is it is a good system but if the person who say I was on safe date and I was going on a date if I could somehow make the other person know that I was then it would it would be very efficient because you mm. know if if I was going on a date with someone who had predatory intentions um and they knew that I was being tracked etc then obviously they might they, not pick you, then, yeah. yeah they're not going to do anything um that's the thing we I mean we can't you know it's not a band-aid that's just going to fix sure, a big no. problem that society has with online dating um it's if we can help in any shape or form or just save as you said if it stop puts off people guys from going down the route of being that predator mm-hmm. just because they've seen that the person has a safe date yeah. icon on their dating profile then you know that's great yeah it sort of it helps in some capacity we well, think you stop the cascade early i think that's it it seems like um a lot of what happens i think there's premeditated mm. acts which are you know that's a whole different individual and then I think there's the ones that have this sort of rolling progression. And I think if they get nipped in the bud early by just that, like even the logo just saying mm. you're, you're being observed, um, I think that could be um, a fantastic way of dissuading people. Will there be a reverse audit side of things, which I guess goes into a more murky territory that if you went on a date with some guy and, and the feedback's generally becoming, we keep getting like flash up signals of people being alerted every time. Like, what do, does one do about that what the same guy yeah so the same guy that's another that's another um thing and so we've got different things we're adding and actually one of the one of the bits is if you have had a you know bad experience then you can flag a person up and it'll be anonymous and they won't know but in the event of the same person gets flagged up by x number of people right then it's you know we will might be able to hand over the details interesting um yeah well and ne- necessary but i guess yeah also it's like raises exactly. some some but there's all you know the whole gdpr side of things though um and the data you know and the security and that we've had to you know it's been a lot of minefields we've had to navigate mm. around on that level when you're dealing with people's personal information um so there's only so much we can and can't do but because it's anonymous because it's just it's tracking your phone your whereabouts and that information and also you know if the police do get involved then you know you have to hand it over mm-hmm. um and that's not an invasion of privacy it's going well this was her route this is where she's been and who with yeah um, i mean you do assume that someone signing up to the app 
to use it like that would would agree to yeah. have that data shared if something went wrong yeah exactly and okay. if, you know it's like when you sign up to facebook you waive the right pretty much yeah um you hand over your data to, and every app you sign up logging in via facebook they, it always comes up saying you know you're giving permission for that app to use your data yeah and then it goes to cambridge analytica and <laughs> <laughs> the u.s government and people kick off and you're like well um, you yeah. tick that box every time allowing all these apps to have your data and now you're kicking off because that data is being used <laughs> will the um will the existing dating apps pay you some kind of licensing fee to inter integrate at the, the moment no it's a free app and it's free for anyone and we don't see you know at the moment we won't charge it's kind of it's more for us it's more of a social responsibility yes. <laughs> type app and an add-on to what we do um and you know we don't know we've got the rest of our apps and the rest of our technology and digital platform that is commercial so and but i mean but there's you know there's loads of different angles and one of the you know another angle that we're looking at is actually integrating the safe date into pubs and bars and and having safe date friendly mm -hmm. venues so that they have a certain application tech and within their system so if you log in say you're going on a date in this bar then that info will come up at the bar so the bar will be aware that these dates are happening yeah in their venue and, and what the person looks like on the date so they can you know they'll be able to make sure they're all right as well do you have any designs um because you, you this is a, a great sort of custodianship of, of people going and, and potentially endangering stuff do you have any designs on tackling the workplace issue having experienced it yourself have you, have you had any thoughts about how you might try and reconcile workplace harassment or, or to be honest it's sort of it's a tricky it's a tricky area unless you're within that it's business by business right it's people being within that business um and the hrs and the you know and the women themselves in that business and also the guys you mm. know actually the whole thing with me too i think what from talking to male friends of mine who you know and a lot of them are senior in the city and so it's made them properly step back and realize that men have behaved like utter arseholes and it's not acceptable you know it was like well that's just how it happens and it's made them probably think twice and go well it shouldn't happen mm. that's the bottom line it, that whole well it's that's just how it occurs that's just what happens is no longer a valid excuse um so that whole culture it just it needs to change but the people within it can only change it so you know we can't do anything to help a big city bank no um all we can do is empower the women and a lot of our members are city women and empower them and make them feel more confident and the one minute they feel like that then mm. they won't put up with it so i mean there's a danger that companies can really get it wrong yeah. um, and it really it re requires some thinking about um and in netflix in their office um you you're not allowed to maintain eye contact for five seconds see that's just ridiculous which is wow. just nonsense like, that's the thing is you know a lot of it's ridiculous and i also you know i'm very behind much behind most of the me too campaign but then i also see just really silly girls jumping on it claiming xyz mm, or yeah. a look or a hand on the shoulder yeah and it's just got ridiculous and it's just sort of you know it's very obvious what is acceptable and what's not acceptable and general slight banter yeah yeah there's got to be some yeah. kind of of of, of personal interpersonal chemistry mm. whether you know you'd have that with a, a guy colleague where you can take the piss out of each yeah. other or, or be matey and you need that off as well. or even or even flirt like even guys, guys yeah. definitely flirt with each other yes and like that's <laughs> it's, it's it's like an important yeah when um, i was working you know and even though one yeah, there was always you know it's always good to have some office candy that you know it'd make your day a bit better mm. <laughs> to do a bit yeah. of flirting but there's a difference you know between that and you know say a guy you know one of the directors i work with who sort of made me sit right next to him and was always saying well put your short skirt on tomorrow because we want to win this pitch and i need Jeez. your legs out and it's like that i lived with five guys rugby guys at university you know i've got a lot of male sports friends mm. and the band is disgusting yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, and, yeah. and fun but you're used to it and it and actually it's not being abusive in any way so i can take it yeah mm. so it's kind of it was never me being precious it's just there's a line there is, yeah. of how you behave and what you well, if it say. makes you feel devalued as well yeah, then exactly it's... i just thought no i'm not going into a pitch yeah as the token piece of meat to look good and, and if that's what you're selling your business on it's like no that's not how it should be i think me too has been good in that 
um, as the people you alluded to, it's made them sort of rethink um, some of their attitudes and hopefully that will continue to produce a, a sort of a change in the way some men um, think. But also in part, now it's maybe become a bit retributive and like, and so it's a sort of failure of conversation and, and you know, as you said, people are just even lying sometimes mm. just because they want a bit of um, publicity or they just want to get revenge on someone. And that's when it becomes dangerous and that's when it makes, um, or it could make men disappear into a shell where they think, okay, oh, there's this, even there's this thing called the Pence Rule, I think it's some, some guy in the US. He, sa he says that don't take any one-on-one -on -one meetings with women because you could be called out. But it's just ridiculous. This, well, it's yeah. also bad for women because yeah. if they're not allowed to take a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with not, someone who yeah. could potentially advance their career or, or, or invest in their company, whatever it is, but if that guy feels like he can't take a one-on-one -on -one meeting with mm. her because he might end up and it shouldn't be I, I don't like you know it's them and us I don't you yeah know, it's no. it just oh it's just people yeah it's humans it's people we should have the same you know opportunities the same and I always say that people say you're a feminist I'm like I don't like the word feminist it's but an ist yeah it's sort if, of like a you know but yes I am in that you know as long as we have the same options the freedom to choose yeah um whatever we want to do and we want to work if we don't and, but in the same way i have an issue with you know women that judge the stay-at-home moms mm -hmm. like if that's their choice mm -hmm. and that's what makes them happy and that's been their drive since they were little then they're no less than you know a 24 7 career woman yeah. earning 200 grand in the city that doesn't make them any better women it's that it's that choice yeah um and you know i've got one daughter already and another daughter incoming and it would be great if they were but then at the same time if that's not their drive yeah. and not what they want to do as long as they're not lazy yeah and as long as they're not they don't assume that you know some man's going to pay for them mm -hmm. and that the world's going to fall on their head mm -hmm. then you know they can choose whatever they want to do and whatever they want to be and that to me is that's the feminist side it's having that choice and that independence yeah um but I just think also with the whole, you know, everything that's going on, there's actually a, a divide happening mm. between men and women and well, a lot of resentment and hatred towards women by guys because they are being told not to have eye contact for more than five seconds, not to have meetings, you know, one-on-one -on -one with women. Yeah. And some angry women, you know, who get offended when the door gets open for them or the seat gets oh, off. God. It, it's a minefield for guys. I feel very sorry <laughs> for yeah. men at the moment. But it's like, because you, what you're going to get is good guys tuning mm. out because they go, this isn't me, this isn't me, this isn't me. And unfortunately, they're also some of the ones that contribute to the solution as well, which is, you know, they, they can police other men, which is important. Because um, the, the, the breakdown of manners, I think, is is actually useless I think man has stood to show signals of intent later on mm. you know if somebody was polite or could do something like open the door it's like okay it doesn't it's not about I can't open the door myself it's about just a way of, of doing that kind of it is, social it's respectful bar. and it, yeah and, and it is manners and, and I, it's disarming it's going I'm yeah. willing to 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 you know acquiesce do the right thing so hopefully that will continue and if somebody didn't have good manners I think you could audit them way before you know if somebody barged through the door you can go okay, mm. I don't want to progress this conversation or any kind of you know, relationship-based discussion with them because they clearly don't have the basic principles. And, and as guys, we try and use that as sort of a measure of, of showing our, our intent. Because um, I went to uh, uh, a day party in London recently and as a guy, this, this sort of bothered me. Um, these two girls, we, we were queuing for drinks and these two girls came barging through the front of the queue. Oh, my mate's over there, my mate's over there, blah, blah. And we've been waiting for about half an hour and we turned around and said, uh, I don't think they are. There's a queue here. We've been waiting for ages. Oh yeah, just move out of the way, just move out of the way. Shuffle through to the front of the queue. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I was like, uh, and at that point I was like, no, wait, there's a queue. Just like, just stand at the back of the queue. No issues. Yeah. And then one of them turned her back to me. He's like, he's trying to talk to me. He's trying to talk to me. It's like, I'm not actually, I'm not trying to talk to you. I'm not trying to hit on you. Literally, there's a queue. Mm. We've all been waiting for half an hour. You're just trying to go through just to the front the back. because <laughs> you think you, you can get away with it. And it's quite hard to know how to handle those situations because you don't want to be aggressive because that's threatening. Yeah. But at the same time, you're just like, this is taking the That's the thing. There's pits. a lot of girls. You're right now. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you're right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just about, got, just about got over it. Yeah. No, there's a lot of girls that take the piss and they, you know, and they are behaving like that and it's not helping in any shape or form and it's and it is creating this fight 
um, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be an angry thing. It shouldn't be a hatred thing. It shouldn't be a fight. What's happened over the last year is actually really exciting. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've got more of a voice and more opportunities and we should be embracing that and guys should be embracing that um, without any resentment, resentment and without women man bashing. Mm. You know, it's not needed. Mm. You know, it shouldn't, we shouldn't have, have our independence and this freedom at, you know, um, at the extent of you guys not being happy. <laughs> it's sort of, um, it's not yin and yang. Yeah, it's like yeah. both of us going forward together and working in partnership. Yeah, it's communication, conversation yeah. again. Um, I'm going slightly conscious of the time. Yes, indeed. So I guess the, the next um, section will be quite interesting to, to chat about is to dive into more of the entrepreneurial existence um, that you've you've gone into and what's steered that or helped uh, educate you through that. I also know that you, you am I right in thinking you do ultra marathons? Yeah, so I do, um, um, I run a, a big group called The Sisterhood and that's been going on so the length of time as kittens. It's, al it's always been my, the yin to my yang. Right. <laughs> um, and I've always been a sports nut. Um, and The Sisterhood is a big group of girls and we do lots of crazy sports events and social events in aid of various kind of women and but children's charities. Is that stress relief for you? Does that just let you clear your mind? Is it just getting... It, well, exercise, yeah. I mean, exercise has always been my thing. I was a sports nut at school and at university. I did sports science and it's always been my outlet. Um, and even now, you know, I've exercised throughout all pregnancies and even now I swim about 5k a week. <laughs> and um, It just sort of, it clears my head. It kind of, I try and do it in the morning mm. and then, you know, and, and that repetitive side i used to be a bit of a gym money bunny but got quite obsessive yeah. after uni and it wasn't healthy yeah, you can do um so i got more into triathlons and the running outside that got me into the ultra marathons or or open water swimming and that you know and i know i'm built more for we joke that you know it takes me five kilometers to warm up and then i get fast and fast <laughs> um God. and it it's just it's my thing in that repetitive sort of running or swimming is when I do, especially swimming is when I get a lot of the work done mm. in my head or I can be angry about something but by the time I come out of the pool or the lake or wherever I'm swimming it's sort of you know all the priorities are, are right and everything's sort of back in place and it's just, yeah, it's, it's just always been my outlet. Oh, it's interesting because you're right with, with the gym you can kind of become your own taskmaster and it can become very um, rigid or ironclad um, but I do think touching base with somebody with a sense of physical personal achievement um does make you just sort of reassess your priorities or just say you know yeah it's not worth mm. it or, or i'm taking myself on a, a crusade to make sure um i'm healthy and doing stuff differently because i find that work can get very obsessive in its own way as well and it's like yeah you need the outlet and also it's it's discipline and i say you know to people that actually people that exercise you know i can't remember the stats but there's a certain it's a very high percentage of ceos actually played team sport mm. at school and were in first teams or university they were they come they were sports and that's the thing and it's being in that team and it's that you know it's the drive and the motivation and the working together and people having different positions and different skill sets it's sort of it's actually that sports thing is very transferable into into the business world mm. and do you have any advice i guess for um especially in these times female entrepreneurs and, and leaders um, that you could impart that's been useful for you in terms of growing your own business or just interacting with? I think, I mean, one of the things is, and I think that's, you know, there's this argument that there aren't enough female CEOs or female entrepreneurs, but a lot of that is women, we doubt, we don't have the confidence mm. that guys have. We have that self-doubt and the niggles and, well, we can't do that. And, or, you know, women have just had, you know, two babies and they want to do something themselves and they're all, oh, we're never going to be able to do that. Men are much more sort of, the testosterone and gung-ho and we can do it chances um, as well yeah exactly and, and taking risks as well and that's just fact so i you know i'd say for the female ones doing it i always say just you could just got to go for it if you if your gut is telling you it's a good idea and that you really really believe in something you've just got to go for it and i say think about what's the worst thing that could happen you know you might have to go back to a nine to five or if you're single and young and you're starting up, you might have to sleep on your parents' sofa because you can't afford the rent or a friend's sofa. If you can deal with the worst case scenario, then you've got nothing to lose. Just go for it. That's sort of what I did with mine. I thought, well, if I can't pay the rent, then I've got various people's sofas mm. to stay on and I'll give myself a couple of years. 
um, and at the same time get, especially on the women's front, you know, find find mentors, find women that have done are much further down the line than you. So people that have maybe been running their business for ten years or five years, um, and just talk to them and ask them what they do differently, what they've learned, what they think are the most important things right at the beginning of setting up and have that, have the sounding board. Because mm. it's very lonely. I mean, I didn't. Um, and it's kind of something that maybe looking back would have been really helpful. But it was very, so I was in a very male industry mm. and actually too bloody minded to really care. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what other anyone else thought. Um, but I know a lot of women who are starting out and you know, I've, I, I've got my mentor to quite a few girls and get random emails from people I've never met and will always have time yeah. to chat to and them. We could do entrepreneurial so kittens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And, and one thing I think specifically in your case, because there is a, um, a sense of judgment cast over people going into becoming entrepreneurs because um, it sort of unsettles people. Anybody who's going down a corporate path and hears somebody doing something themselves, they kind of want to be it either supportive mm. or disparaging and particularly with you because you were cracking I guess um, controversial ground um, how did you deal with any any with judgment haters. <laughs> yeah any, and, and did you get it from um, family members did I you got get it, it you know I had it with everyone from everyone I had it from old school friends and to be honest that drives me it's sort of I would right. say that actually the best you can do to me it was never about the money it was it's only now that I'm kind of feeling a bit com more comfortable with actually even the title entrepreneur. It was never, it was, I had a belief in something. I wanted it to work. I knew it was gonna work. I knew it was important. Um, and every time I had saw hostility or someone made a comment, actually got the fire in my belly, mm. really fired up and the screw you watched the space. Um, and even now we joke that, you know, my list of proving people, of people that I'm proving wrong keeps growing so the more it goes on the list gets longer and it just you need you need that fire you need that passion and the reason why you're doing it and the whole ethos behind why you're starting something if you start something purely for figures and money reasons and well I want to be earning this in six months time it's not going to happen I always say that money is the byproduct of success it just sort of mm. it comes but if you focus on if you make that your focus then you lose sight of you know why you're doing it in the first place and um i guess we, we normally have a question about what entrepreneurial books you read but i think in this one i might change say anybody looking to uh, gain female empowerment or to understand this world a bit better are there any books you've read that you said oh that's amazing but you know what? There's, i mean there's one there's one business book that's really um it's a really easy read it's called mission mm -hmm. um my, michael Heyman and nick giles and it's it's really straightforward and it's sort of it's about the mission behind all these businesses the trailblazer ones mm. so they've worked they run a big communication company and they've worked with the likes of airbnb and apple and virgin um and they wrote the book having seen all the ceos and how they operate and realizing that they all have the same sort of traits and the personality traits and the same reasons why they started businesses um and yeah so anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur or understand the mindset of an entrepreneur that's a really easy it's a small book so it doesn't take long to read we'll just chuck that with behind the mask as well i have another mm -hmm. plug for that really, yeah, yeah. read really that and the, yeah <laughs> um and one last question i've got just to, to complete this section is um does killing kittens ever sort of try and take on the porn industry and some of the negative associations because i think it's i think it's a bit of a negative industry in terms of i think it's, it's a bit damaging um is that on your roadmap to ever sort of challenge the status quo there or do something to not to be honest i mean i'm you know being very aware of the porn industry you know the whole way through but i'm also very aware there are there are already um you know erica lust is a big one there's already women in the porn industry who are taking it on for like me um they're taking on the status quo they're doing female friendly porn and sites and you know, it doesn't need me involved but then in can, it can, can, you, can you lobby to to remove or, or lobby against some of the, the bad practices? We can definitely get involved. And actually, you know, the, the poor, a lot of it, the rules all changed um, in the last couple of years, which I know people, you know, they have been up in arms about. You know, it's things like, um, something like men can, ejaculation, men's ejaculation can be seen on porn. Women's can no longer, you can't have a, yeah. 
so the rule the, le the legalities of what can be shown and can't shown um, but again it's a minefield and with the online side it's sort of you can put all the rules out there there'll still be a, a site that shows the the porn that's been banned mm. um, so there's only so much just a, yeah, a massive battle for, yeah. yeah I'm mm. not quite ready to take that one <laughs> <laughs> you've got enough on your plate yeah exactly um, to, to wrap up then um, is there anything that we can do or, or rather can we ask our audience to help you with crowdfunding signing up to the new app signing up to the new app yeah I mean we've got I mean it's just busy <laughs> we've got you know the crowdfunding ends ends, ends of July end of July it's on Cedars um, the Safe Day app launched last week and then look out for Kittens World and the whole new you know KK mm -hmm. technology and platform and app that will probably be launching September we're cool. testing it on members the next month um, and that's it really just watch the space cool <laughs> sounds good and thank you very much for coming on thank it's you so much really interesting no worries if you enjoyed this or any of our other conversations, we'd love to get your feedback. Our Twitter handle is at the Startup Mike, M I C, or get us an email, audioed at startupmicrodose.com. If you're feeling particularly generous of spirit, a review on iTunes would go a long way to ensuring that we can continue to bring you these conversations. Finally, this recording could not have happened without the support of Founders Factory backed Entail. Their podcasting software and studio in the Daily Mail building, London, are as ever the unassuming stars of our show. Check out entail.co. And thank you for listening. Goodbye.